Good evening and welcome to Election 2014. Tonight is the second in our series of live debates with candidates seeking to secure your vote for them and their electorates and for their parties in the coming general election. The next three years will be one of the most critical periods in the future of the Canterbury region as it approaches the crossroads of rebuild and recovery. With now a little under five weeks until voting day, the critical issues are becoming clear. The candidates are campaigning, door knocking, holding street corner meetings to deliver their party policies and personal promises in an effort to secure your votes. Candidates have increased their work rates, there is no doubt about this. The question I have for you is how well do you know your candidate? What they have to offer from a personal and party perspective and most importantly, how effective will they be in this critical phase of rebuild and recovery? Each week on election 2014, we're joined by a panel consisting of the candidates who want to discuss the issues that are affecting their specific electorates and the wider Canterbury region. Our aim is to give you, the voter, more information about your candidates and the parties they represent. You will be better informed when you go to vote. Last week we heard from candidates seeking to represent the Waimakariri electorate and we discussed critical issues facing the electorate including traffic congestion, the balance between growth in a rural economy and the impact this has on the environment and the topical issue of the rebuild. This week we're looking at the Port Hills electorate. Now which, this was created in 2008 um, in the general election uh, for 2008 election and it replaced the former Banks Peninsula electorate. This area has historically been a Labour stronghold with the exception, I think, of three years in 1996 when it was held by the national candidate David Carter at the time, um, it's been represented by the incumbent and Labour Party candidate contesting the electorate this year, the Honourable Ruth Dyson. Ruth, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. The New Zealand First Party candidate, I'd like to welcome you. You're the List MP, Port Hills, Dennis O'Rourke. Thank you. Eugenie, you're representing the Green Party. I'd like to thank you for coming along. Thank you, and thank you CT for organising the programme. It's a pleasure. And Nook Karaka, you're representing the National Party, uh, candidate, sorry, you're representing the candidate uh, for the National Party. Thank you for coming along. Thank you, Tim. Now, what we'd uh, like to do is the same protocol as we had last week. We'd like you to all to tell us a little about what you stand for at a personal, your connection with the parties you represent, and we'd like to find out just the little bits that drive you, that are going to drive you through this election and drive you if you're elected. Now I'd like to start with you, uh, Nook. Um, two and a half minutes please and I'll ring the bell at two minutes. Thank you and good evening. My name is Nook Karako and I'm a dedicated proud Kiwi and, I, and who sincerely wishes to continue contributing to ensure our country remains a great place. In fact to make it an even better place than what it is now. Tonight I want to talk about the things that really matter to our people. Like a strong and prosperous economy world-class health, education and welfare services and safe communities. All of these things are very, very important because to me they build the pathways to what I really want, which are vibrant communities with plenty of opportunities supported by great leadership. Our family has had close connections to the Port Hills for over five generations. My wife Christine and I have raised our four sons here and I have run my own businesses working very hard and employed local people. I have a proven track record of making good choices alongside and on behalf of my family and my community. I have a worldly disposition as my travel career has taken me to live and work in many countries across the world. I hold senior leadership roles in my iwi Naitahu and I sit on a number of commercial boards. I also do a lot of voluntary community work including being on the board of Chumley Home the Rod Donald Banks Peninsula Environmental Trust and I'm a Justice of the Peace. I'm someone who has integrity and respect of others, friend or foe. I have a strong and hard-working disposition and I will represent the Port Hills with mana and finesse. I can engage with people from all walks of life and political affiliations and I can move easily between the Maori and the non-Maori worlds. I live the things that you value in your families, in your communities and in their leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nock. Eugenie, please tell us about yourself. 
Kia ora koutou, good evening. My name's Eugenie Sage. I'm a Jaffa that rolled south. I grew up in Auckland, but Christchurch has been my home for nearly 25 years now. I've been a Green MP since 2011. Before that, I was a Cant uh, Canterbury Regional Councillor until, of course, the National Government decided to do away with our elected regional councillors in 2010, and then I stood for the Green Party. For the last three years as a first-term MP, I've been a strong voice in Parliament for our environment, for conservation, local government and the Christchurch rebuild. We've reached the limit of the number of dairy cows in many parts of New Zealand, but there is no limit on human creativity. That's why the Green Party is proposing to spend a billion dollars over three years on research and development, because our investment in research and development is less than half of that in many OECD countries. So we can, instead of producing more commodity products like more milk powder, more raw logs that you see going out of the port at Littleton, we should be investing in adding value, creating jobs. Jobs in manufacturing have been in free fall since 2008. Our innovation package, the commitment to research and development to an extra thousand places at university and polytechnics in engineering, science, maths and technology would help us get a much more diverse economy, more jobs locally. I've been a strong advocate for clean water. We can have clean rivers, but that requires stronger rules to control land uses that pollute our waterways and our aquifers. When we have the Medical Officer of Health warning about rising nitrate levels in our aquifers, we need to stop the ceaseless expansion of dairying and invest in clean water. And we can do that through our innovation package. The Green Party will provide a fairer, cleaner, smarter economy and keep our rivers clean. Thank you, Eugenie. Dennis, please tell us about yourself. Thank you. I'm standing for New Zealand first because I want a fair go for everybody. A country where people can get jobs with fair wages, where a 40-hour week is enough to live on, where school leavers are assisted to get the skills they need, and where small businesses are encouraged and assisted. Where taxes are fair so that taxation reduces and doesn't increase the growing gap between the wealthy and people on middle and lower incomes. Where the cost of living is brought under control so that power prices are not set to ensure rich profits for near monopolies. Where the cost of food is not burdened with tax and where rates are not taxed either. Where first home seekers can afford a home of their own or pay fair rent for decent accommodation. Where families can educate their children without financial burden and where the state system is the priority, not the latest education fad. Where class sizes are more important than teachers' bonuses. Where students will be helped to reduce their debt if they stay in New Zealand to use their skills here. Where families have an excellent free health care system and have enough to save for the future and to retire with security and dignity at the age of 65 years. The sustainable retirement age, which only New Zealand First will guarantee. And with a super gold card improved with free doctor's visits and a power discount and better access to public transport. And at this election, more than any other, we must all stand up for and fight for a decent democracy, not riddled by dirty politics, nor see gifts, uh, uh, gifted, seats gifted by the National Party to minor parties who can't make it by themselves. They need to be taught a lesson and, to, and the only honest, fair-minded and sensible people of New Zealand will see to it that that's the case. You can do no better than giving New Zealand first your party vote in September. Thank you, Dennis. Now, Ruth, please tell us about yourself. Thanks very much, Tim. Can I just <clears throat> begin by thanking you and acknowledging CTV. This is a great step in democracy to have the opportunity for people to listen to the four of us. And I also want to acknowledge the other three candidates, Nook, Eugenie and um, Dennis. I'm Ruth Dyson. I'm the current Member of Parliament for Port Hills. And I'm standing again as the Labour candidate in my electorate. I have a reputation for working hard, for listening to people and for getting things done. 
and we all know there's still lots more to be done in our area. I'm strongly connected to what are very diverse communities within the Port Hills electorate, both the current electorate and the new electorate with the changed boundaries. I see the role of a Member of Parliament as being an advocate, as providing information and of being a support person. I've done that, whether it's with churches, with businesses, with sports organisations, with community groups, with individuals, with schools. As an advocate, as a support person and in providing information, that's the way you empower people and ensure that your leadership role is one that benefits the people that you ask to vote for you. I also want to commit to working in a strong partnership with our community boards and with the four council wards in our electorate. We've got strong and caring communities. We've got passionate people who are, are really joined and united by our hills, by our rivers, by our estuary and our harbour. I've got a proven track record. I'm a very open person and I'm accessible. I'm hardworking and I'm reliable. And it would be a privilege to be elected again as the Member of Parliament for Port Hills. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. Uh, it's been very informative. We've learned a lot about you and often it's, um, it's difficult to know in a short snapshot what the candidates stand for, what they've been doing and uh, what's on offer in the next term if they're elected. Um, wow. Sitting in your lounges, hearing that, it's got to be great. Thank you very much. We're going to take a short break and when we return we're going to be talking about infrastructure, what the party policies are around managing what is there at the moment and approving on it in the next term. Thank you. Don't go away. Welcome back to Election 2014, where we're distilling the important issues for the Canterbury region in the lead-up to the coming general election. Before the break, we heard from the candidates as individuals, getting to know them, what they stand for, and what connects them with their parties. Now let's look at some of the important issues facing the electorate, and understand what they and their parties are going to do on these matters. Now let's look at an important issue facing the electorate, and this one is infrastructure. Littleton Port, Littleton Port Recovery Plan. This was a directive from the Sarah Minister, one could say another directive. This is a 30-year plan, so to be successful, there will be a number of parties in government during this period holding the baton through its implementation. Labour Sarah spokesman, uh, person Ruth Dyson, I'm going to uh, start with you. What are your views on the plan and the process that's underway? Uh, well, I think we need a port recovery plan and I certainly welcome that. I think the process um, is a little more truncated than would give me total satisfaction and one of the biggest concerns I have is the potential environmental changes with the expansion of the uh, around the coal handling area. Um, the, the expansion that's proposed in the what's been widely regarded as a 30-year plan for about 30 years, um, could have significant implications for the rest of the harbour and I would like to see a very robust process for ensuring that damage doesn't occur further up in the harbour as a result of that expansion. We, we need a recovery plan, we need a very strong port of course, uh, I want to make sure that local people have a strong voice and an input into any changes that are made and, and that some of the key concerns that are currently outside the recovery plan could be included in the port company's considerations as well. So it's truncated but the basis is something which you'd be able to work with moving forward? Absolutely and I have been, I went to the launch of the um, recovery plan, I've been a strong supporter of having the Port Talk cabin yes. on London Street in Littleton, a lot of people have been going in there, it's good but we have to make sure that it's just not all um, on the face of it, it has to be real consultation. Local people's voices have to be heard. Dennis? Yes, well of course there's always been a significant tension between the commercial operations of the port and the people who live in Littleton. And that's been going on for decades and there has been a plan in gestation for decades as well. It's good to see this plan start to get near to fruition and implementation. Uh, I certainly support the overall plan. I'm sure that there are ways in which it can be tweaked and improved. Uh, it needs to fundamentally get on top of the traffic issues, the big trucks that have to go through the port, and access to the waterfront. 
it's been a real shame that access to the waterfront has been so difficult, almost non-existent in fact, for so long. And yet Littleton has such a lot to offer. People not just in Littleton itself, but in Christchurch. And of course we need to have a berth for cruise ships again so that we can attract that business. But fundamentally it's a matter for the people themselves to decide and I'm glad to see that they've had pretty good access to input on this occasion. Great. Eugenie, big environmental issues around the port, big environmental issues around the plan. How do you feel it's been implemented? Are you happy with the process? I think it is good that we're doing a plan because we saw the 10 hectare reclamation go ahead without any real public input and the port's wanting another 20 hectares plus. We don't think that that should be used for a coal handling facility because coal should stay in the ground in terms of the impacts that it has on climate. But the port is a critical regional asset and one of the troubling things is the pressure that the anchor projects are putting on the city council to sell strategic assets or shares in them like the port company. They provide a substantial dividend return which helps keep rates in Christchurch low. So if the Greens are part of a new government, we would be much more flexible in how the cost sharing agreement is being implemented to take away that pressure to sell assets like the port company. It's critical, it's the third biggest port in New Zealand, it's the biggest um, container handling in, this, in the South Island, it's got the only dry dock in New Zealand. Um, with the insurance settlement, it's now in a position to um, redevelop and rebuild. And in Littleton, you hear the big thump of the um, pile drivers every day with the repairs and the redevelopment of Cash and Key. We want to get the cruise ships back, but we need public consultation. We need those environmental effects to be looked at. But most of all, we need the port company to remain owned by the Christchurch City Council and its partners. Can I pick you up on one comment there? It's obviously a key economic driver into the electric. Agree. But it also, a large amount of that's coming through the coal handling. How does that environmental, um, how do you balance the economic drivers and the environmental well, issues there? Well, um, I mean, it employs about 500 people. It's, one, I think, the largest employer in Christchurch. And it's predicting a 10% increase in container volumes each year. So that's container shipping, not coal. Right. And I guess our policies in terms of innovation and getting more manufactured products so that we're not seeing raw logs go out, we're actually seeing manufactured wood products, we can diversify, increase our exports by adding value. Nook, views on the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, uh, I just confer, confirm about what um, Eugenia has said and also the fact is how important this port is um, to the local community, um, to the wider community, and also to the South Island, because this port is the commercial lifeline into the South Island. And the great thing about this, in some ways, you've got the Christchurch earthquake and certainly Phoenix is rising from the rubble. And when I say that, I say that on the basis that this plan is, has been around for quite some time, the aspirations for this plan. And it's really great that our earthquake minister has actually, what he has done is that he has instructed now the port along with ECAN um, to get moving uh, on a, um, a, a port plan, a port development plan. Now the interesting thing here is that, um, you know, there's always been that angst between the local community and the Littleton Port Company. And the situation here is that what they've done is that there's always been, you know, that sort of problem with, um, you know, they're not thinking about the community and the Littleton Port was always about, um, you know, we have to make a dividend and all of that. So what I'm saying is that this plan is fantastic because I live on, on the harbour and I live at Rapaki actually where we believe that um, with the development of Cash and Key originally, um, you know, there was a lot of environmental impact on that. But what we're doing now is that, you know, we acknowledge and people acknowledge that this is a working port and that's why this is a great idea so that we can all work together to actually get, put our, um, um, uh, put our um, information up there through this process so that everyone can submit and then we're going to get hopefully a really uh, important collective plan to go forward. And there's always been, I mean, I've spoken to um, Peter Davey, you know. I mean, when I was, I went for council last year and one of my things was that I wanted to have an advisory group that actually could work 
with the Littleton Port Company. We have that advisory group now at Rapaki. That's where it started. It's called the Mana Whenua Group. We want it wider, though, so all the other communities can actually so be able to do that. Can we cut this up into a government, yeah. though? Do you think the government's done an effective job? I mean, a lot of the plans that they've, you know, that they've done in the city, on the other side of the hills, possibly have been done in too much haste, um, and the results are such that they're not coming through. Do you think this plan has been well designed and has been under the control of the national government? Do you think it's been a, a good process? Are oh, you absolutely. Happy with the I, I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. And when you actually talk to people, you know, I mean, these are the things that people are saying, you know, right around the harbour. And they're saying, look, we're working together on this. We, we, we're looking at, a, we're wanting a healthy harbour. If the port is doing well, uh, the town is also doing well. Success of the port flow on from the, um, you know, for, for businesses and all so of that. Think... But the problem will be, Tim, if the national government is re-elected, it's highlighted that it's going to proceed with major changes to the Resource Management Act. And it's the RMA is one of our key environmental laws that lets people have a say on things like the big reclamation. Agree with Ruth about the potential for environmental impacts there. So if national gets back in, it will gut the Resource Management Act. So there'll be a limited opportunity to have our say on some of those big issues. Thank you for that. But can I just, just sorry, but sorry, I just really need to say is that yes, that, that is right because I mean it's 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 not like a fast track. I mean there are going to be controls in place. What we're trying to do is to get this thing moving because it's it's actually it stopped and it went backwards. Now we've got the the the, the people with us and we've got the desire from the Littleton Port Company to work with those people, and we can go forward with this, not backwards. Not standing still. We're going to develop the Littleton port in conjunction with all the major stakeholders. It's a key part, it's a key jewel in the crown of the electorate. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The region, not just the electorate, yeah. it's actually yeah. the region. But when, we talk, about, when, when we talk about the um, the environment, I mean, you know, Tangata Fenua, I mean, they are actually working with this. And as I said, there was a big impact on it 40 years ago. But they're building this port for the future. And that is the big thing about this plan. Okay. You know, there's a lot of vision here okay. as what <laughs> needs to on happen. The port, I'm just going to have to, uh, we have to go to a break. So it's a short time to take a break. When we return, we may continue on the port and also we'll talk about economic activity, which is kind of coming from the port and other areas of the electorate um, within the Port Hills electorate. Please don't go away. We'll be back soon. Welcome back to election 2014. Before the break, we heard from the candidates on the assets and the infrastructure, and the debate was around the Littleton Port and the importance to this asset within the electorate. I'd now like to talk about the economy and how it affects the Port Hills electorate. The electorate is home to many small businesses. Many of these were hit hard in the earthquake. What's being done to support these firms, create an environment for more businesses to start? Now, Nook, I'm going to start with you on this one. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, it is about uh, a strong and prosperous economy. And I think the, the great news that came out, out today around the fact is that, you know, we are on track for a budget surplus of over 290 million. I mean, core crown expenses fall by 30% from 35%. Average GDP was 3.3% compared with a budget forecast of 38 You know, all of this, 83,000 more New Zealanders in jobs to June 2014. Forecast uh, 2018 is going to be 151 odd thousand. Two years to March, annual wage increased by approximately 3,000, and the forecast is 2,018 to 6,600. All this is great news, um, particularly for our Port Hills electorate, because it's actually about you know, being able to um, develop our businesses around a really strong and prosperous economy. I think the great thing too is that when we, I talk to a lot of businesses across the Port Hills, one thing that they always say, thank God for the national government in the fact that they assisted our business throughout the emergency. And one of the major reasons for that was the fact of are about 30 million that they gave for uh, businesses to actually continue going after the earthquake. So that's actually had a great impact on what's happening in the, in the Port Hills. Okay. And when, when I look at one EPL, I mean, the fact is that they've moved now from into uh, from Bromley um, into the into into the Wilson Industrial Estate. That's a brand new factory, and okay. that's a great yep. story. Okay, Eugenie. Well, I think what we've had today with the um, pre-election um, fiscal and economic update is showing what poor managers national really is, because the surpluses have gone down predicted services, largely because of the decline in dairy prices. And it just shows that National has focused far too much on a simple commodity economy, milk powder and raw logs. 
and debt under National has risen massively. When National came in, it was about $3,000 a person net, and now it's around $14,000. So they're not good economic managers. We've got a very simple economy, and we want much more investment in research and development, a much more diverse economy where we have more jobs in manufacturing. That would benefit the Port Hills as part of the wider Christchurch um, economy. And businesses have done it hard. Yes, the assistance um, immediately after the quakes was useful. There's been a mushrooming of businesses back in Ferry Road, but it's been really hard work. And we need an economy where there's much more investment in research and development and in innovation. Thank you, Jenny. Dennis. Yes, well, of course, National hasn't really produced a surplus at all. They cut half a billion dollars off the Christchurch earthquake rebuild for the purpose of manufacturing an artificial surplus. And then within days, John Key was talking about the possibility of having to spend another $5 billion in Christchurch over the next several years. So what kind of surplus really is that? And New Zealand does not have a strong economy, I'm sad to say. Um, we have relied on a dairy boom now failing. We have relied on a very slow Christchurch rebuild that nobody could applaud. And we now have $60 billion of current account debt. And New Zealand's international indebtedness as a whole is $150 billion. This is not evidence of a rock star economy, just the opposite in fact, and I agree with you, Janie, National's handling of the economy has been absolutely abysmal. And, uh, and uh, this talk about a rock star economy is just absolute nonsense. New Zealand first has a policy for a strong New Zealand economy based on four things. One, a flexible monetary policy and reform of the um, Reserve Bank Act. Um, retaining New Zealand's infrastructural uh, assets in New Zealand hands the innovative and coherent export plan, which we have developed, and a national savings plan, including our new proposed Kiwi Fund to encourage savings. But we want to assist manufacturers and exporters in particular, and especially small and medium businesses, because they are the backbone of the New Zealand economy. Those are the businesses that produce jobs. Those are the businesses at the ground level which produce New Zealand's wealth. That's both in agriculture and in manufacturing. So we want to improve that with incentives and tax breaks and assistance with marketing and a whole range of other things like that. Ruth. Um, I agree with the fundamental point that both Dennis and Eugenie made in relation to the weak base of the New Zealand economy currently. We are too reliant on dairy. It's a very fragile market, as we've seen in recent times with the milk prices, and we send far too much out of our ports in an unprocessed way. That, that's a waste of opportunity for New Zealand. So we're importing goods that are processed from our raw materials. We're importing them from overseas, where they get the value add as well as the jobs that go with it. It's just a nonsense for the national opponent here tonight to be skiting about the budget. Uh, we know that the so-called budget surplus was on Jerry Brownlee's gerrymandering of the infrastructure rebuild books. It is a fact that he took $500 million out of the predicted infrastructure rebuild cost in Canterbury in the budget, printed document available for anyone to see, at the very same time that our City Council had the Cordamentha report and the Cameron and Partner reports saying that the estimated costs had gone up dramatically. So how can you have one set of books saying, oh, it's $500 million cheaper now for the infrastructure rebuild. That's what Jerry Brownlee and John Key said. At the same time, two independent reports saying that the City Council's contribution was going to be much higher than it was before. So, so it's just a nonsense. The budget is shonky. In terms of the Port Hills electric, we've got a really great mix of both manufacturing and retail, and, and we've got some very proud stories to be told about how some of particularly our bigger manufacturing businesses got through the quakes and have started to recover, but some weren't able to. We've had a number of our manufacturers close, not just because of the quakes, but because of the competition from imported goods mm -hmm. and because of the overly high value of our dollar. So that combination is putting huge pressure on our manufacturing. They've lost the research and development support from central government. Labor introduced it 
National has taken it away. That's a core part of supporting the manufacturing sector. And frankly, our retail businesses are just heroes. The ones that have survived are doing it despite the massive population depletion in the areas. They need support. More people should go out, drive past the containers uh, to get to Sumner and the other parts of our electorate that are quite badly hit and where so many people have left. They need our support now more than ever. Can I pick up on one comment that was made, and it was value add. And I'm just going to talk about value add because obviously, you know, one of the things you're talking about, um, Eugenie, and uh, and also, well, basically across all the parties, is, is actually want to see more value add. Now, the key issue I've got there is that New Zealand can't compete on a labour cost. You know, we've got steel being imported for some of the major projects underway in the city, which is coming in from overseas. You know, we've got a problem here. So if we go and base an economy which is on more value add locally, how are we going to be able to compete on that international market? But we are smart and we can have niche products. I mean, in Christchurch we've been a base for um, design of outdoor um, gear. So, and once upon a time we had a lot of woolen manufacturing here. But as Ruth said, the price of the, the dollar has, has driven, helped drive that down. So we need to focus in, in the Green Party policy more um, research and development in uh, ICT sector, in the renewable energy space, whereas the government of course has sold off um, our energy companies which provide the platform to get a slice of the trillion dollar market in, global renewable, in renewables globally. So we can grow our manufacturing base but we need to invest in research and development to take the good ideas that people have and take them to market. And New Zealand First wants to introduce tax incentives to encourage businesses to export manufactured products. Uh, we want to see uh, a new tax rate for those who export uh, of 20% as opposed to 28% as it is now. We think that would make a big difference to, and we would also like to uh, invest directly in more research and development as the Greens do and again to provide tax breaks. We think that those sorts of incentives will get people to see that they can do better if they manufacture products from our raw materials and don't just send raw logs and carcasses and su such like overseas. That's the way to go. And that's what we're, and, and that's what we're actually doing. Look, can well, I just, not, uh, can no, I just, no, can no, I just come back? Manufacturing that, exports look, have been declining. Not my other colleagues when we talk about the economy, and they've just stated it there, the three of them, is that to us the glass is half full. To everyone else, every other party, the glass is half empty. And the situation is, the, the, the situation what? is though, is okay. that you know, we are actually <laughs> doing the job. We are, we are actually moving in the right direction for a very strong and prosperous economy. We're going to have to stop there. I'm just going to have to, um, we're going to have to go to a short break. Don't go far. When we return, we'll be talking about post-earthquake recovery. Thank you. Welcome back to Election 2014. Before the break we heard about the economy in the Port Hills electorate and what's been done or not been done as the case may be to grow this. Not surprising there's some differing views from different parts of the studio. Now we cannot however have a debate in Christchurch and not talk about post-earthquake recovery. So Littleton, the port surrounding residential areas were hit very hard in the February earthquake. Now Sydenham was also badly damaged and still remains with a lot of empty sites. Many residential homes on the hills were badly affected. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask, um, I'm going to start actually with Dennis. Um, how do you believe the, the recovery's gone and uh, what would you be doing differently? It actually started off reasonably well but then ground to a very, very slow pace with some very bad decisions made. So I think the first thing we need to do is to actually get rid of Jerry Brownlee because he's been a poor manager, whether National gets back or not. He's been more of a dictator and not a leader. He hasn't taken people with him. I think we need to amend the SARA Act to ensure that it's more human rights based and not just property based. I think that we need to have another EQC property project manager, not just Fletcher's. That was a mistake to have a monopoly on that. We need to put more pressure on Housing New Zealand and give them more resources so that they can take faster action to repair homes and to build more for people. We need to regulate insurance companies so they have a specified time within which they have to settle claims and if they don't then it's handed over to a Crown agency to do it for them. We need also a new standard insurance policy that people can rely on instead of the 93 different versions we have already of a, of a um, 
full replacement policy. We think we need a new state insurance office as well. We need to ensure urgent action for the remaining uh, red zone port hills. We think that's a disgrace, it's taken so long. And finally, with regard to people who had bare land or uninsured land, the offer of 50% of the 2007 valuation is the grossest injustice I have ever seen in this country, let alone all of the other bad decisions this government has made, especially Jerry Brownlee, on the rebuild, and that's got to change. New Zealand First is committed, and always has been, to pay them the other half of that money. Ruth, I'll go to you on this. Well, I think this is a topic that we all feel really mm. passionately about. I, I really regret the fact that Jerry Brownlee didn't take up the opportunity that all parties offered, yeah. which was to do this together. What more would Canterbury have needed to have gone through? in order to get a cross-party agreement. I can't imagine that we, you know, what could have been worse to trigger that? Every party said we want to do this together, put party politics aside, let's get our region back on its feet, and he said nut and walked away. I really um, regret that, actually. Uh, I think there's a lot of positive things that are happening in our region, and every new building or every new development, everything that, every new shop, we're getting a supermarket in our suburb. We're just about popping the champagne corks. So there's a lot happening that we should, enough, we right? should celebrate. But, but I tell you what, the recovery overall has been very slow. It's been very messy. Um, the minister has not been a leader. He's been like a bulldozer. I resent one of our heritage buildings being demolished to widen a road when it could have been repaired and we could have had the magnificent Majestic Theatre back again. I, I think that was a mistake and it was done with no engagement with the people. What I'd like to see different, and it w which will be different if there's a change in government on the 20th of September, is that we put people at the centre of every bit of our thinking and policy making in terms of the Canterbury recovery. People feel like they have a government that is just bulldozing over them and I want to be part of a government that is on the side of Canterbury people. We can do a lot better and I look forward to just getting back that vibe that we have had so often in the past in Canterbury and taking people with us on the recovery. Look. Well, I think that, um, first of all, I, I obviously disagree with what's been said about the, uh, the, the rebuild. And, and can I just make this point again, is that this government, our national government, is totally committed to the Christchurch rebuild. Really, $15.4 billion of taxpayers' money has actually been committed or really to a $40 billion rebuild. The other part of this is the fact is that you know, when you look at the other disasters from around the world, this is the most expensive natural disaster Why in the history of New Zealand. Why did they take half a billion dollars off when the, the $5 was is, needed? The situation is, though, is that, you know, we are moving forward. Things are starting Slowly. to happen. Things are starting to happen. Just read some of the We're reports. We're a wee way on, I mean, it is, yeah, it's a, it is a wee way on. So. Well, but, but, you know, things are starting, though. I mean, all the underground, all the horizontal infrastructure and all what that. What about the people been, on the port hills happens, who yeah, you know, I still live on the port hills. I live on the so port hills. I. I'm one of those people. What about people. those people who still can't get into their do. homes, who still That's can't I, do I'm anything with their sections? OK, I'm More than three and a half years later. Can I just say And they're still out of their homes. That's disgraceful. I really do disagree with what's being said here tonight, because I don't know where you guys have been but just travel We've around been at home. and then look that's right so come out of home and go and have a look at the great things that are happening uh, in the CBD talk to people talk to a lot of people talk to the 80 odd thousand people yeah, have actually been yeah. done that so well, yeah, we anyway, listen to people look we and have them in our no, offices. Them and they will tell you. You haven't, they obviously. Will tell you. Yes, I have. You haven't heard I anyone have, or you would know Dennis, what the problems I'm were. I'm one of the people who have been affected. Yes. And so okay. am I. Yeah, well, I know. So I we've all been affected. People. You're not special. But I think the great thing about this, though, is that we're moving forward. You know, you're very you're envious, moving forward but this badly. government, no, moving have forward a badly. I mean, we just Could, talked about the Littleton Port. We just talked about infrastructure. We just talked about. Do you about seriously the, the think Absolutely. Jerry Brownlee is doing well? Absolutely, Nobody I think else Jerry does. is the only guy okay. that could have done that. You need mm -hmm. someone like Jerry to keep pushing forward, keep his head on the horizon, yeah. and keep moving. I'm going to ask Eugenie to give us some some thoughts here. Well, I think the national government has been a bulldozer, and Jerry's been driving the bulldozer. 
If Green Party is part of government, we would give the city back to the people by restoring democracy. We'd hold elections for ECAN next year. We would make the city council and the people of Christchurch at the centre of decision making. That's why we'd provide more flexibility around the cost sharing agreement so that the council can invest in the infrastructure. We'd put a major investment into public transport. Christchurch is really congested. We need to be investing in buses and rail, in cycleways that are separated from the roads so that we can connect our city and get round faster. And we would make sure that we don't go ahead with the stadium because that's a $300 million white elephant. If we don't proceed with that, that takes a substantial amount off the funding gap that the City Council has. As, as okay, far as the port itself so is concerned, we really need another route to the port, not just the tunnel or the, the Governor's yep, Bay, Bay route. Yeah. And there is one available from uh, Port Hills Road over to near Cass Bay. And that should be urgently looked at as a new alternative route. Okay. Because well, I don't think Evans really Grass is going to do That would be really it. good. So that's we're, your answer to it, is it? We're going to have to. That's one of the that, answers, yes. No. <laughs> we're going to have to close up here, go to a break. Um, don't go far. When we come back, we're going to ask each of the candidates around, um, uh, the issues days. that uh, keep them awake and that they will stand for and that they will complete if they're elected for this coming term. Thank you very much. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back to Election 2014. This evening we're talking with the candidates vying to represent the Port Hills electorate. Before the break, we heard from candidates on the post-earthquake recovery in the electorate. What's been done, what hasn't been done, what could be done. It's now time to ask candidates what they will do during the next three years if elected and what will keep them awake at night during this term. Now I'm going to start with Eugenie on this one. Well, what keeps me awake is the sound of heavy rain on the roof, worrying about landslips in the Port Hills, overloaded stormwater systems and flooding. And it's thinking about the changes that we need to make here in Christchurch to cope with the more extreme weather events that we're getting as a result of climate change. The national government's been asleep at the wheel in terms of climate change. Our emissions are increasing and we need to do our share to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we are part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. If we have a Green Party as part of the government and you give your party vote to the Greens, we have got a climate protection plan that will help reduce emissions. That's because I love Christchurch and I love New Zealand and we want a cleaner, fairer and smarter New Zealand. Our policies will help reduce greenhouse emissions and give Kiwi businesses and families a tax cut. We can have rivers like the Selwyn and the Heathcote clean enough to swim in again. That requires stronger laws and a better bottom line, not like National's one where rivers are only fit for wading, not for swimming. And when we've got one in every four children living in poverty, something is very wrong. The Green Party's policies with our children's um, tax cre children's credit will make sure that families get an extra $60 a week who are currently missing out. We want warm, dry, healthy homes, not cold and drafty ones. National's given the cold shoulder to the Warm Up New Zealand program by slashing funding. We would restore that funding and we'd be part of a stable, progressive new government. To do that, you need to give your party vote to the Green Party. Thank you. Nook. Thank you. I just want to um, go through a few things, particularly what the Labor and the Greens are all about, because what they want to do is put a capital gains tax on all productive businesses and, uh, and farms. They want to introduce the big fresh water levies. They want to introduce a carbon tax that is five times the world price. They want to restore a national award system for regional employers to pay wages the same rate as in Auckland. And they want to put the brakes on more trade deals. And they want to clamp down on, dairy, on their dairy industry and oil and, and uh, gas exploration. That's what they want to do. And what keeps me awake at night is that concern that people will lose focus on why we can't afford to put at risk all of the gains that we have made over the last two terms of the national government. We can do this by voting for an unknown and messy coalition, Labour, Greens and Mana.com, and New Zealand First as well. I'm worried that people will be swayed into believing that the 28 billion worth of promises made by Labor and the Greens to date can be delivered. I know they can't be delivered and all we will get will be higher interest and inflation rates and that will hurt Kiwi families. 
If we want to remain in surplus and reduce debt, big spending promises are not the answer. We need to stay on the pathway of creating more jobs, provide more support to families and to keep New Zealand going in the right direction. And that's where we're going at the moment. To do this, I'm asking you to give your party vote to National in order that John Key can lead a third term National Government. I'm also asking for your candidate vote because it is time for a change within the Port Hills. Vote for Nook Karako, as I will be your strong and effectual voice, accessible and I will listen to you. I am hard working and I never forget who I represent. We need a strong and connected MP at the decision making table for the next crucial three years, where we will see greater strides made in our journey to repair will rebuild our homes, our communities, our city, and together we will build strong families and a strong nation. Vote for Nook Karako, Port Hills National Party candidate. Dennis. What keeps me awake at night is the cost of living. Rises in uh, power, rents, rates and food are doing immense damage to Kiwi families. Key promised not to increase GST, remember that, and then promptly increased it to 15%. In 2009, he reduced tax for the highest earners at a staggering $5.2 billion of revenue. Now the incomes cap in New Zealand is the worst in all of the OECD countries, and we have the fifth highest food prices in, in any of the 34 OECD countries. New Zealand First will take food off, or rather GST off all food to assist struggling Kiwi families. The cost is $3 billion a year, funded by a clampdown on $7 billion a year worth of tax evasion and the projected $3.5 billion surplus. Food is exempt to some degree in Australia, the UK and most of Europe because they do not see a family's food as a proper object for taxation, and neither should we. We will also remove GST from rates on residential property, and we will grow the economy by targeting sustainable, high-value, job-rich industries with tax breaks, incentives, and marketing assistance. And we will raise the minimum age to $16 an hour immediately, and then move as soon as possible to a genuine living wage. National's housing policies have totally failed, driving rents up to crippling levels and making it too hard to buy a home. New Zealand First will establish a new agency to acquire land for development and will sell sections to first home buyers with easy payment over 25 years. New Zealand First is the common sense party who will give New Zealanders a fair go and a decent clean democracy where people matter more than politics. So we ask everybody watching the programme tonight to give New Zealand first their party vote. Ruth. Um, thanks very much, Tim. In our electorate, we've been through a huge amount over the last three and a half years. We've had, as everyone knows, a large number of quakes that was followed by floods, some of which affected the same people. And then we've now got thousands of people who have been told that their property has potentially contaminated land we've still got a long way to go. But we do have green shoots of recovery. We do know that things are starting to turn the corner for many, but many more are still left behind. I want those people to have a strong advocate, a strong supporter, and somebody who will be the link between them and the numerous agencies that currently just shut the door on them and don't provide them with the information that I think they need and deserve. EQC, our core state-run organisation with Minister Jerry Brownlee living in our own town, now says that it will take seven or eight months for you to get an official information at request back on your own file. People are desperate for information, they're desperate for answers, and they're desperate for decisions. I've got a reputation for listening to people, for working hard and for getting things done. And I want the opportunity to continue to do that. I'd love to be re-elected as the Member of Parliament for Port Hills, and I also want to ask people to give their party vote for Labour. It's time for a government that is on our side, and I know that Labour can provide that leadership and that vision in government. Thank you very much. In wrapping up, I would like to thank the panel very much for joining me. Ruth Dyson, Dennis O'Rourke, 
Eugenie Sage, Nukarako. Thank you very much. Well done. Pleasure. Thank you. Next week, we're looking at the Christchurch East electorate when I'll be joined by Labour MP and candidate Poto Williams. National Party candidate Joanna Hayes, well Joanna Hayes, Green Party candidate Mojo Mathers, and Internet Party candidate Leighton Baker. See you next Tuesday, 7pm on CTV for our next live election debate on election 2014.